Hi, Saddleback Church. How are you? Well, for those of you who have no idea who I am, my name is Buddy. Everybody say hi, Buddy. Hi. Just the bald guys say hi, Buddy. Hi, bald guys. We got to stick together, don't we? Hey, I'm going to continue on with the series that we have been in for the last few weeks. If you want to take out your message notes and take out a pen, I've got some things for you to write down today. I've got some things you're going to circle in these verses, actually pretty close to the top of the message. But we've been looking at everyday heroes, and that's where we're going to go today. But I want to start by looking at a couple of verses to sort of set up where the message is. Both of these verses are from the book of Ephesians. So let me begin with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible says, for we are God's masterpiece. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a masterpiece. <clears throat> Some of you look like a Picasso, but you know what I'm saying, you're a masterpiece, right? <laughs> it says, we're God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. And then in chapter 3, he says this, and God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power, circle the words his power, according to his power that is at work within us, circle the words within us, and draw a little line between those two circles, his power within us. He is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God wants to do something great through your life. He wants to do something that will outlive you, something that exceeds your own, not only your own expectations, something that exceeds your own capabilities, your own capacity, something that exceeds who you think you are. God has a plan, a purpose for your life. That's what we just read in those chapters, that God has called us to something. The question for every believer is not, God, what can you do for me? The question for every follower of Christ is, God, what can I do for you? How can I serve you by serving the world that you love so much? The world he loves so much that he gave his only son to die for it. That's the question of a follower of Christ. Lord, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? The call to be saved is the call to serve. That's what Ephesians 2.10 says, that you've been made new in Christ so that you can do the things that God planned long ago, long before you even knew him, the things that he had planned for you to do. One of the truths that we have built this church on is that every member is a minister. It's not just the people on the stage. It's not just people with a, a special collar that every member is a minister. That's what the Bible teaches us. We are all called into ministry. We all have a role to play in the body of Christ and in the world around us. That's what class 301 is about. If you've not taken class 301, you really should because it's about discovering God's destiny for your life, how he puts you together, how you can serve him by serving people in the world. And the verses that we just read not only tell us that God has a plan, but it tells us that that plan will exceed everything that you could ask or imagine. So, what are you asking? What are you imagining? You see, if you don't take time to ask, if you don't think about what you're imagining, if you don't have any expectation, then you'll never know when God has exceeded your expectation. He says God is able to exceed his expectation, and he's going to do it, your expectation, he's going to do it according to his power that is at work in you. So whatever you're asking God to do through you, whatever you're imagining that he can do through you, be prepared to do more than you imagined, but at the same time, be prepared to do it with less resource than you thought you were going to need in order to get it done. Because if your dream, if what you're imagining God could do through you, if it doesn't require faith, then it's not a big enough dream. Everything we do for God has to be done in faith. What can he do through you through his power? 
If you're waiting to get started, you think God is giving you an opportunity. And if you're waiting to get started on it until you've got all your ducks in a row, and you've got all your questions answered, and you've got all the resources available that you're going to need in order to get started, if you're waiting for all that to happen, you're never going to get started at all. You just go from where you are, and you go from with what you have. And then you see what God can do through you. God is just waiting for us to say yes. He already knows what he wants to do through your life. You may think it's impossible. Based on your past, based on your history, where you came from or where you're headed, nothing's impossible with God. You were created anew in Christ so that you could do what God had planned for you to do from the very beginning. There is life and purpose that God has in store for you. There are no accidental people. There are no mistakes in God's kingdom. He called you because he wants to do something great through you. And this is a lesson that we're going to see through an everyday hero today as we look at the life of a man named Gideon. Gideon is a man in the Old Testament. Let me just give you a little background on this guy. Some of you may be somewhat familiar with him. Maybe you heard about him when you were in Sunday school or maybe you, you know, slept through a sermon about Gideon a time or two. It's what I call a Sabbath rest is sleeping in church. I've slept through a lot of great sermons about Gideon in my day. But Gideon was a nobody. He was the youngest member in the weakest family in the smallest tribe of Israel. If ever there was a nobody, it was Gideon. And in fact, the only thing that is remarkable about Gideon is that there was absolutely nothing remarkable about Gideon. He's the last guy in the world that you would look at and think there's a hero there. He's the last guy in the world that would have thought that God could do anything at all through his life. And in fact, when we meet Gideon, as we're about to do when we come to to Judges chapter 6, Gideon is not preparing himself to do something great. He's not sharpening his sword. He's not preparing for battle. He's not trying to rally the troops to go and do something and take on all the bad guys and change the world. When we first meet Gideon, he's hiding. He's a coward. He's afraid. He's just scraping out a living, and he's doing the best he can to not be noticed by anyone. But after God gets through with Gideon, this ordinary man, he has done some extraordinary things. God uses him to set an entire nation free. And he uses Gideon in ways that Gideon never could have dreamed. It far exceeded Gideon's expectations of his own life. As I said, many of you might know his story. He's the guy who defeated an enemy army of 135,000 with just 300 men. You can read that story in Judges 6 through 8. Read it when you get home. Don't read it now, okay? But read it when you get home. And see the the remarkable story of this everyday hero. I don't have time to go into all of the detail and mine all of the wealth out of the whole story. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to focus on just three parts of his story. But as I thought about Gideon and I thought about all the messages I've heard on his life, I thought, you know, there's three things I've never actually heard anybody talk about. So I want to talk about those three things today. But before I go any further in that, I just want to take a minute and and talk about what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about his battle. I'm not going to talk about how his army was reduced from 32,000 to just 300 by God so that God would get the glory for what happened. And I'm not going to talk about Gideon's fleeces. You remember the fleeces? Uh, Let me explain the fleeces to you for just a second while I'm talking about what I'm not going to talk about. So when, when God first spoke to Gideon, and told him what he wanted him to do, Gideon wasn't so sure he was really hearing right, so he he put out a a little wool blanket, a fleece, and he laid it out on the ground, and he said, God, if, if I'm really hearing you right, then tomorrow morning, let this fleece be wet and all the ground be dry. Let it be wet from the dew. And the next morning, that's exactly what happened. So then Gideon says, well, you know, I'm still not quite sure I'm really, really hearing you right, so let's do it the other way now. I'm gonna lay this fleece out again, and tomorrow morning, Um, let the fleece be dry and let the ground be wet. And that's exactly what happened. The point of all of that is that there's nothing wrong with laying out a fleece. There's nothing wrong with asking God for confirmation. God did not get mad at Gideon 
for asking for confirmation of what God was saying to him. You see, Gideon, it wasn't that Gideon doubted God. Gideon doubted his own ability to hear from God. And God accommodated his request. He did exactly what Gideon had asked him to do. And I I just got to tell you, as a pastor, I wish more people would do that. Because it's amazing how often I hear from people who got themselves in trouble because they just ran off with some harebrained idea and they thought, well, God told me. And God is going, I didn't say anything. (laughs) And then they get themselves in all kinds of trouble. Or they did nothing because they were afraid. They thought it sounded too impossible. And so they never really looked for confirmation either. I guess the ultimate lesson in all of that is don't believe everything you think. Take a minute and ask God, is this something you're really asking me to do? Go to the Word and look for confirmation. God will never violate what He has already said in the written Word. So it's okay for you to lay out a fleece. It's okay to ask God to confirm the orders that He's given you. So there, now I've talked about the things that I wasn't going to talk about. Now I want to talk about the things that I am going to talk about. I want to talk about what happened before His battle and before His task went from difficult to impossible. The three things I'm going to talk about today, I want to talk about Gideon's call. How did God call him into his destiny? I'm going to talk about his call. I'm going to talk about Gideon's sacrifice. And I'm going to talk about Gideon's anointing. Because if we don't understand these three things, then we really can't grasp all the significance of the rest of the story. So I want us to look at this historic passage. And we're going to look for the eternal truth. That's what you do when you read an Old Testament story. You're looking at at an historic passage, and you're looking for the eternal truth that applies to our life today. So let me start in uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The words are on the screen. They're also in your notes. The Bible says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. That first word in that passage says again. Let me just explain what that means. We need to understand some of the background. It's been nearly 300 years since God's people finally moved in and occupied the promised land. 300 years. That's longer than we've been together as a nation in the United States. For 300 years, they've been living in this promised land. Joshua has died. It was 250 years ago that Joshua died. That whole generation died. And in those 250 years, God's people forgot God. They wandered away from his ways, and they began to worship the idols of their culture. And you read about it all through the book of Judges. It was a, this cycle that they went through, that they would turn their hearts toward the idols of the culture. God would then turn them over to the oppression of another nation. They would call out for help. God would send someone to deliver them. They'd come back to God for a while, and then they'd begin to worship idols again, and God would then hand them over to another nation, and then he'd send someone to deliver them, and it just went around and around and around. So when we come to chapter 6, it says, here we go again. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so he gave them over to the Midianites. So here's lesson one you can write in your notes. Lesson one is this. When you worship the gods of your culture... Don't be surprised if God gives you over to the oppression of your culture. You see, if you want to wander off from God's ways, he's not going to stop you. But at the same time, you can't expect him to protect you from the consequences of your decisions. So let's see what happens next. Verse 2. It says, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, the caves and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So the angel of the Lord came, and he sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abiasrite, 
where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I want you to circle the words mighty warrior, the last two words of that passage. He calls him a mighty warrior. Gideon had been living under the oppression of an enemy for seven years. This isn't just a couple of weeks of difficulty. It's not just one or two months that had gone by where life's a little tough. Seven years have gone by where all of his labor has come to nothing. That everything he worked so hard for has been taken by other people. It's been lost. It's been stolen. It has just dissipated and disappeared. He has nothing to show for himself. And it makes me wonder how many of us can relate to a season like that in our own lives, where it seems that the fruit of your labor is being taken by everybody else and you don't even get a taste of it. Or that the credit for all the work you do goes to someone else. You don't get the credit for it. Does it ever seem that the faster you pedal, the slower you go? Or the harder you work, the less you have to show for it? And maybe you don't even have the energy to fight anymore. You're just, you're just hanging on, just like Gideon was. That was his life. He's worked so hard for seven years and has nothing to show for it. All he has seen is fruitlessness, hopelessness, injustice, fear, shattered dreams. God seems to be nowhere to be found. And it's into this context into this season of Gideon's life, not in his best days, it's into his worst days that God shows up unannounced and calls him out of despair and calls him into his destiny. He calls him into greatness. If you are in a season of despair, don't be surprised if God shows up out of the blue and calls you into greatness, calls you into a destiny, and says, I have something for you to do. Why did God choose Gideon? Because he could. He's God. He can choose anybody. In fact, the Bible is full of stories of God choosing anybody's. The Bible says that God chooses the weak to confound the strong. He chooses the simple to confound the wise. And that's what we see him doing in Gideon's life. He chose Gideon because God knew Gideon better than Gideon knew himself. God could see things in Gideon that he never dreamed were even there. Abilities. God could see something about this man that he didn't even see himself. And God calls him a mighty warrior. Gideon is hiding in a wine press, threshing out wheat. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. He's doing it because he's hiding. He doesn't want anybody to find him. Gideon is living in fear, and God calls him a mighty warrior. Gideon is hiding from his enemies, and God calls him mighty warrior. Gideon was outnumbered, outclassed, just sneaking out this meager existence. And as we're about to see, he grew up in a household of idolaters. Gideon is not a good little Sunday school boy. Gideon is not a church kid. His family worshiped idols. And yet God saw something in this man that he did not see in himself. Gideon never would have seen himself as a mighty warrior. But God could see it. And God called him into it. He defined him. So let me ask you, how do you define yourself? Do you think that it's impossible for God to do something great through your life? Do you think you've gone too far or maybe not far enough and you think that there's nothing God can really do through me that will have any lasting impact on the world? Well, let me give you lesson two. Here's lesson two. Don't ever tell God who you are not. Let God tell you who you are. Let God tell you who you are. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what he wants you to do. He puts you together. He is determined to do what he wants to do through your life. When God called him a mighty warrior, it was God's creative word. In fact, look at what the Bible says about this in Romans chapter 4. It says, God gives life to the dead, and he calls things that are not as though they were. 
And that's what he did in Gideon's life. He called something that was not as though it was. He says, you are a mighty warrior. And the rest of the story is about Gideon becoming what he already was in God's eyes. A mighty warrior, a great leader, a hero, becoming a man who was worth writing about. So let's look at Gideon's response when God calls him a mighty warrior. It's in verse 13. He says, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has put us into the hand of Midian. Now, I'll just leave that verse up there on the screen for a minute. I want you to look at the very first word in his reply. But. But. What's he doing? He's arguing. He's just putting up an argument. He's not willing to agree with what God said. He's going to argue with what God said. He says, but the Lord has abandoned us. Well, Gideon, if the Lord has abandoned you, then why is he standing there talking to you? He says, but what, about, what are all those wonderful things that you did for the people before us? Why aren't you doing anything for us now? You see, Gideon has forgotten something. He's forgotten the process. All he wants is the results. He has forgotten how God blesses people. He wants God's blessings without doing what God wants you to do in order to receive the blessing. He is blaming God for the trouble that the people have brought on themselves. They're in all this trouble, and he's saying, God, why did you let this happen? So he's blaming God for their trouble. He's forgotten why God gave them over to the Midianites. He has forgotten that God blesses people who make themselves blessable. All, God, all that Gideon could see were the immediate circumstances. All he could see was what? He couldn't see the why or the how. So now we have to look at God's response. And it's interesting that in God's response, he doesn't even answer Gideon's questions. He just ignores it altogether. Here's what he says in verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? You see, in essence, Gideon was saying, God, why don't you do something? And God says, Gideon, why don't you do something? That happened to me once. Years ago, I had a friend who was not a follower of Jesus. He was a long way from coming into a church or having anything to do with God. But I loved my friend, and I would pray for him from time to time. And I, I clearly remember one day driving to work, and I was thinking about him, and so I started praying for him. And I said, God, I, just, I wish you would just speak to him. And that fast, God said, Buddy, I wish you would speak to him. It was like, well, duh. God uses us. We are his mouthpiece. Here I was trying to get God to do something, and God's saying, I want you to do something. I've got a plan. There's a reason that I put him in your life and put you in his life. And so to Gideon, this, this man in hiding, this man who is living in fear, Gideon, who is ill-equipped and inexperienced, who is underqualified, the man who has no strength of his own, God says, go in the strength that you have. Am I not sending you? It's amazing how often we become the answer to our own prayers. He says, go in the strength you have. Let me ask you a question. You believe God might be calling you to do something? I believe there are people in this place where God has been speaking to you, has been showing you something he wants you to do, and for some reason that only you know, you've been holding out. Maybe there is a wrong that you know that needs to be made right. Maybe there's somebody you know who has no voice, and they need your voice to come to their defense. Maybe there's a ministry, a service opportunity, that you've been sort of thinking about and feeling like, well, you know, maybe God wants me to get involved in this, but you've been just sort of putting it off and, and waiting for something else. Maybe there's a peace trip that you've been feeling like, I, I believe God wants me to do this. He wants me to go. But you've been putting that off too. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for more experience? 
more time, more money? Are you waiting for somebody's uh, support or, or somebody to give you permission? Are you waiting for the authority to, to do something? God says go in the strength that you have. In fact, let's look at what lesson three is. If God is sending you, then God is obviously confident that you are the person to get the job done. If he's sending you, then he's confident that you're the person to get the job done. God wouldn't call you to do something if he knew you were going to fail at it. He says, look, just go in the strength you have. What are you waiting for? If you're waiting for everything to just get all lined up, all the ducks in a row, all the answers, you're never going to get started. The Bible says that. Look at this verse in Ecclesiastes 11. It says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. You just go in the strength you have. At Saddleback, we have a, a philosophy of ministry. We call it the your it philosophy of ministry. And basically what that means is that every complaint is a calling. <laughs> if you're complaining about something, well, God's calling you to do something about it. And everybody has different complaints. You see something going on, you say it's not right, or maybe something's missing that should be taking place, some opportunity, some void that needs to be filled, some correction that needs to come into place. That could just be God calling you to do something. We call it the you're it philosophy of ministry. God solves problems through people. God touches the world. He changes the world through us. Everything God does, he does through his people, through his church. As Pastor Rick always says, we, you, are God's plan A. And there is no plan B. It's either going to happen through his people or it's not going to happen. God works through us. You go in the strength you have. He says, am I not sending you? But then we have to look at Gideon's response back to God. It's in verse 15. Here's what it says. But Lord. So there's Gideon's butt again. See, the problem with Gideon, he's got a big butt. <laughs> he says, but Lord, how can I save Israel? But Lord, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. But Lord, I am the least in my family. Gideon's arguing with God. I'm too weak. I'm underqualified. I don't have what it takes. I don't have the connections or the talent. I don't have the authority. I don't have the support. There's nothing special about me. I'm not ready for this. He's saying, God, you got the wrong guy. Well, here's lesson four God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. He's not looking for ability. I, I got some news for some of you. God is not impressed with your abilities. He gave them to you. He's not impressed by them. God is not impressed by your abilities, but at the same time, he is not depressed by your inabilities. God is not limited by your limitations. God is not in heaven thinking about you and going, Man, I just wish he had more money. Wow, I wish I had made that guy just a little bit smarter. What was I thinking? God is not depressed by your inabilities. He's not limited by your limitations. God made you. He knows who you are. He knows what you got. He knows what you're capable of. And he's saying, basically, I'm sending you. You've already got what it takes. He is confident that you are the person to get the job done. He's saying, just go in the strength that you have and stop making excuses. Just get started. Become an everyday hero. Don't ever tell God that he's got the wrong person because God will then set about to show you, to prove to you just how right he really is. But Gideon argues with God. But Lord this, and but Lord that, and but this, and but that, and but, 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 but. And God says, Gideon, get off your butt and get moving. Get started. Take a step. Go in the strength that you have because I am sending you. And there are stories of people all over this room and in every one of our campuses, stories of people that God called into a destiny, people who thought there's no way. There's no, I, I never would have dreamed that I would be involved in the ministry that I'm in. People who say, I never dreamed that I would have been doing what I'm doing for the Lord. 
They never dreamed they'd be involved in a peace trip. They thought they didn't have what it takes. And yet, they were willing to just jump into the deep end of ministry and service. And when they jumped in the deep end, they discovered that they could swim. What's God calling you to do? What's he been talking to you about? What's been annoying you? I'm not talking about the person sitting next to you. But what's been annoying you? What's been burdening your heart? It's a hint. It's a clue of what God is calling you to. And so God then gives Gideon this beautiful promise in the very next verse, verse 16. The Lord answered. He said, I'll be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. God was saying, not only am I sending you, but I'm going with you. So here's lesson five. When you go in the strength you have, God will give you more strength as you go. When you just get started, you go in the strength you have, God will give you more strength as you go. He won't give you more strength before you go because you don't need it. He gives it to you after you have started. This is what we call our on-the-job training philosophy here of ministry at Saddleback, is we don't require people to go through years and years and years of training before they can serve. If we did that, nobody would serve. We'd lose them all. Instead, we just let them jump in. And then once they taste and see that the Lord is good, once they taste and see how sweet and fulfilling ministry and service can be, then they're dying for training. They want to know how they can do it better. You see, God didn't tell Gideon, look, you're going to lead an army, but before you do that, I want you to spend two years in military training, and because these are my people, I want you to also then go to seminary. God just said go. He just said, I know what I'm doing. I know what you've got. I know how I put you together. It's enough to get you started, and by the way, I'm going to make up the difference because I am going with you. So we've looked at this call on Gideon's life, this surprise, but now I want to look at his sacrifice. His sacrifice comes next, and in in verses 17 to 24 of chapter 6, I'm not going to read them now, Gideon makes an offering. You can look at this later, but he makes an offering, and he offers a goat. It's an ironic offering because, after all, what do goats do? They butt. He offers a goat to God, And God sends fire and consumes this offering, but then God speaks to him. He says, you know, that's not the offering I had in mind. There's something else that I want you to do. There's another sacrifice. And he tells Gideon that he wants him to clean house. He wants him to cleanse his household of idolatry. Gideon's family were idol worshipers. His upbringing was among idol worshipers. And here's what God says in verse 25. It says, that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. It's interesting it's seven years old because they've been in this bondage for seven years. He says, take that bull, tear down your father's altar to Baal. Baal was a god of the culture. He says, tear down the altar that your father has built, that your family has been worshiping at. Tear down the altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole that's beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. And using the wood of that Asherah pole, of that idol, using the wood of that pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants, and he did as the Lord told him. God was telling him that he had to separate himself from the false gods of his past. Gideon had to purify himself from the idols of his culture. So here's lesson six. Before God will use you in public, he wants you to clean up your private life. Before he'll use you in public, he wants you to clean up your private life. Gideon had to do some house cleaning. So do we. God says, let judgment begin in the house of God. The old gods, the old ways, the old values, the old idols that we worship, God wants us to get rid of those things. An idol is anything that you allow to come between you and God. It's anything that you look to for 
wisdom, for direction, for value before you look to God. God says, I want that stuff out of your life. They're the things that we spend our energies on, the things that we spend our resource on that are not following after the ways of God. And God says, you've got to get those out of your life. There's a fascinating verse in the book of Jonah. I want us to look at this verse. It says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And God said to Gideon, just like he says to us, quit clinging to worthless idols. They're costing you something. They're causing you to forfeit the fullness of the grace that I have intended for you. An idol is something that you sacrifice to. And so we have to ask ourselves a tough question. I have to ask myself, am I sacrificing moral decency to an idol of indecent entertainment? Am I sacrificing sexual purity to an idol of an immoral relationship? Am I sacrificing my integrity to an idol of money? Am I sacrificing my family to an idol of business and success and climbing a ladder? Am I sacrificing God's highest good for lesser things, pursuing lesser temporal things, and by doing that, I'm missing out on the eternal glory that God wants me to have? Is there anything, here's the question, is there anything that I am still clinging to, something from my past, an old value, an old way of thinking? Is there anything I'm still holding on to from my past? I'm not willing to let go of it, but it is causing me to forfeit the fullness of God's grace in my life. God was saying to Gideon, before I can use you, you got a clean house. If you want my blessing, if you want my presence and power on your life so that you can do beyond what you imagined, then you've got to get into a posture to receive it. You've got to empty your hands of those other things so that your hands are available to be filled with what God wants to put in them. And so that's what Gideon does. He destroys the idols of his past. He destroys the idols of his culture and gets them out of his life. He didn't take them down and stick them in a warehouse somewhere. He burned them up. There was no going back. But then we have to look and see what happened after Gideon's sacrifice. The next thing that happened was Gideon's anointing. In verse 34, it says this, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiasrites, his people, to follow him. It was the beginning of the rest of his story. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. When is then? Then is after Gideon had done what God told him to do. First came that call. Then came the sacrifice. And then came the anointing. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Don't miss the significance of this. It's a life lesson. It's an eternal truth. That God called Gideon out of the blue, out of his despair, before Gideon had done anything to change his life at all. God called him into a purpose, into a destiny, into a greatness. He called Gideon before he changed his life. But God anointed him and gave him power after Gideon made his sacrifice. So here's the lesson for us. Lesson seven is God's call comes before your repentance, but God's power comes after your repentance. God's power came on Gideon's life when he let go of worthless idols. He got rid of the things that stood between him and God's anointing. He prepared himself to be used for God's purposes. He got rid of the gods of his culture. And then the Spirit of the Lord came on him and called him into that greatness that God had planned for him. That's when his leadership took on a whole new level. 
that's when he became the great man of God that we read about. And he summoned an army of untrained volunteers, and with that army of just 300 men, he was able to defeat an enemy of 135,000. That's 450 to 1 odds. Those are odds I wouldn't want to have to face. Those are odds that you could not overcome unless God had done something in your life. And it was the anointing that enabled him to do it. What is the anointing of the Holy Spirit? The anointing of the Holy Spirit is the supernatural work of God in your life that allows you to accomplish immeasurably beyond what you could ask or imagine. The anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life is the power of God that enables you to perform beyond your limitations. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is the power of God in your life that enables you to transcend the level of your own competency. In other words, it's only by the anointing of God's Spirit and His power that you can step back from something and say, how did that happen? I'm not that good. That had to have been God. And that only comes when God puts His hand on you and gives you His power. So how do you get that kind of power? You ask for it. You invite it. You expect it, and you prepare yourself to receive it by letting go of lesser things, by letting go of the idols that are in, in your life. You come to God every day with a simple prayer of invitation and say, Lord, you know what I'm facing today even more than I do, and I confess to you that I can't do this without you. So, Lord, I'm asking for a fresh flow of your presence and power in my life. It's having the courage to say, Lord, would you search my heart and show me, are there any idols, is there anything I'm holding on to? A grudge, a fear, some other value. Is there something I'm holding on to that is causing me to forfeit the fullness of your grace? And if God brings something to your mind, you just confess it to him. Say, yes, Lord, I see that. Renounce it. Release it. Receive God's forgiveness and then expect his hand to be upon you. And then you just do what God tells you to do. Go in the strength that you have, and he will give you more strength as you go. So I come back to a question I asked you of, what is God calling you to do? Is God calling you to save a nation? Probably not. But is he asking you to serve a community? Absolutely. That's why he put you in the world where you are. Is he calling you to serve the body of Christ, to serve a church, to get involved in some kind of ministry, some kind of outreach? No doubt about it. God has a plan for you that is greater than you. Something that will outlive you. He's just waiting for you to say yes. He's waiting for you to go in the strength you have, to not make excuses, to step out in spite of fear, to move forward, to let go of worthless things, and then to receive the power that he wants you to have. So I want us to close this message by looking at a verse we started with, and I actually want us to read it together out loud. It's here on the screen. Let's read this verse together, Ephesians 3.20. He is able to do immeasurably more than all I ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within me. Let's pray together about this, all right? Would you bow your heads? Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the life of Gideon because we see that if you can do something great through him, you can do something great through anybody. And this room is filled with anybody's. Lord, we thank you that you call us into a partnership with you for the great privilege, the honor that you give us to partner with you to accomplish your plan in the world. Lord, may we be people who always are asking the question, how can I serve you today, Lord? What do you want to do through my life? May we be people who are fearless in asking you the question, Lord, is there anything that I'm holding on to that you need me to let go of? And may we have the courage to follow in obedience, to release the things, the idols of our culture, 
and to worship the true God so that your anointing, your power can come upon our lives. Lord, I pray that you would fill us and empower us for the ministry that you're calling us all to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.